All right, so we are going to be looking at uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. We are looking, this is week 5 of our series. So here we have on our screen the, the uh, first verses here. We've had uh, Paul in the last section, he challenged the Colossians to avoid some of the the false teachings, uh, the misdirection that was being given by some of the opponents in Colossae. Uh, they were giving advice of how to live moral lives, of how to be followers of Jesus, but uh, Paul says that, that the things that they saw as wisdom weren't really wisdom because they weren't centered on Christ. Uh, they were centered more on doing actions rather than being, doing on Christ. And so Paul wants to reorientate the community once again on Jesus. And as I've said several times, everything always goes back to the Christ hymn in Colossians 1, 15 to 20. And so here again, as Paul goes into a new section, he's going to remind the Colossians of this hymn. So he opens and he says, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So here Paul is, is recalling um, Jesus's death, resurrection, and exaltation. And he's reminding him, look, you've died to your past sins, but you also are raised to Christ. And if you are raised to Christ, think about things that are heavenly, things that are above. Think about where Christ is, that he's seated at the right hand of God. As Christians, we often call Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ, and we just take for granted that name, Lord. We don't even think about what that means to be declaring Jesus to be Lord. Uh, but the Lordship of Christ is something that is there to remind people uh, that Jesus is in charge. And take a moment, I can hear some people chatting. So I'm going to stop share for a second. Let's see here. I'm going to mute everybody. Mute them. There we go. Everyone's muted. I can, that should take care of it. Um, all right. So if you're raised, okay, see with things above. So thinking about Jesus's lordship, that he is exalted, that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. The book of Acts makes a really big deal about this. Um, when you read Acts, it's interesting because only the Gospel of Luke and only the book of Acts talk about Jesus's ascent to heaven. They're the only ones that talk about Jesus going off uh, in the clouds and the disciples watching Jesus ascend to heaven. And when you look at the book of Acts, you discover that one of the main emphasis of the book of Acts is Jesus's lordship, that because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, that the prayers to Jesus are effective because he rules over the universe with God. And Paul wants to remind us of that that we don't need to be thinking about things here on the earth, but we can be thinking about things above in heaven. And we can have confidence in our prayers because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. So verse two, set your minds on things that are above, <clears throat> not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, so also you will be revealed with him in glory. And so again, he's reminding the Colossians um, that just as Jesus died for their sins and was buried, uh, that they too have died from their old ways of life. And that, that part of the Christian life is a continued remembering of dying to our old self and living our new life in Christ. Um, but it's interesting because he says, your life is hidden with Christ and God. Sometimes I think um, we, we wonder uh, what it is that we're doing as a Christian in terms of why is it that we're not fully uh, sinless? Why we still struggle with, with problems? And I think Paul is trying to address this a little bit by talking about your new life. It's hidden with Christ, uh, that we, we have a uh, ultimate time where we're going to see um, ourselves and our perfection revealed, just like Christ is revealed eventually. And we're going to see this great, uh, glorious revelation. Uh, but now here on earth, we still struggle. We, we see the world around us, uh, and it's easy for us to get enticed uh, by the, the earthly things to, to not think about heavenly things, uh, to get caught up with the day-to-day, -to, -day, to get caught up with the things that we can see, that we can touch, that we can taste. And Paul's reminding us that there's a spiritual reality that we need to be clinging to, that uh, we need to remember that Jesus is in charge of our lives, that we're not in charge of our own lives. And so this is kind of the opening before we get to kind of the, the, the meat of what Paul wants to talk about here. Uh, but he's starting off reminding, look, your life is new in Christ. Uh, think about Jesus being exalted, being raised, sitting at the right hand of God, uh, and what that means in, for our own lives. So uh, what I want to think about for a minute is uh, this language here of 
uh, seek things that are above, set your mind on things that are above. You have kind of this goal setting language. Uh, you might talk about uh, vision casting language. Uh, at, at Purpose Church, we talk about uh, our vision is everyone everywhere following Jesus. It was funny at, at this morning uh, as the opening credits were going for our service, uh, hearing Eden repeat uh, the lines of what was being said in the opening service. And it was fun to hear her uh, repeat that, that idea of everyone everywhere following Jesus, that, that this is meant to be part of our DNA as being members of uh, Purpose Church. And what's cool with the online platform that we're in right now is really literally everyone everywhere can follow Jesus because of the internet allows us to gather together on a Sunday morning and not just limited in people that live in uh, the wider Pomona region, but we can have people across the country, across the world following Jesus. And so I think there's some pretty cool realities of what are happening. We talk about everyone everywhere following Jesus, but right now it really is happening. Uh, but there's also irony because uh, while we may have more people from across the world connecting with our church, it's hard for us to connect with each other. We can still feel incredibly disconnected in this, in this online platform. And that's why I'm so grateful for our chance together as a Sunday school that we're getting together and talking about God's word together as a community, because I think it's really important for us to be connecting uh, with each other uh, and being able to see each other, to talk each other, to share stories with each other uh, so that we aren't feeling so lonely and so disconnected. And I love this morning's message that is focused on loneliness and even talking about a period in Paul's life where he was feeling incredibly lonely and how God comes to meet us in our times of loneliness. Um, for Paul here, he starts off, he, he wants to talk about having our minds set on Christ and so I just thought we could take a moment to think about, well, what uh, in our own life, are you someone who's good at setting goals? Are you a person who sets a list of, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm going to try to achieve uh, this sort of thing. You do come up with a list. Are you someone who kind of floats through life and things happen? Either one, I think it depends on our personality, but uh, think about what's your ability to set goals. And then I also want us to think about what kind of goals are easy or hard to achieve in our lives. Uh, and verse five, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever is in you that's earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways that you once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth. Don't lie to each other. So, he says, look, you need to have a focus on heavenly things. But before we start talking about heavenly things, I want you to know what are examples of the sort of earthly things that you need to stop thinking about. Stop orientating your life on these things and start orientating your life on Christ. And so what Paul does here, and I've, I've highlighted for you these kind of two different lists, uh, vice lists that he comes up with, and they're not um, all inclusive. So you can't just look at the list and check it out and say, well, okay, I don't, I don't have a problem with, with these few things, so I must be okay. Paul's just saying, for example, uh, these are examples of earthly things. Um, and so he gives a couple examples of this. Uh, you can see a similar sort of example list if you were to look at uh, the vices of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Uh, here Paul is going to talk about uh, certain vices, certain evil behaviors, evil mentalities that Christian needs to avoid. And the first list, it's a collection of things that would have been drawn from wider moral philosophy. So Greek and Roman people would have thought, yeah, those are bad things. But he also has this mixture of things that a, that a particular Jewish audience would have seen as, uh, as being uh, not godly. And so uh, he starts off with fornication. Um, that's the word porneia, uh, which is where we get pornography from. It's sexual immorality. Um, it's, it's a catch-all term for sexual morality. Uh, and so um, for Jewish people, Jewish people, when they thought about Gentiles, they thought about Gentiles as being sexually immoral people. That was one of their chief sins was fornication of sexual morality. Another thing that, that Jewish people accused Gentiles of was being unclean, the unclean Gentiles. And this word impurity uh, this is also the word for uncleanliness. And so a Jewish person said, yeah, uh, we, we need to stay away from Gentile um, sexual morality practices. Gentiles, they're impure people. So yeah, don't be like that. Um, and then you also get this last phrase here, this with, which is idolatry. 
uh, Jewish people really considered the Gentiles to be idolatrous people. They worshiped all these false gods. And so uh, part of this list is thinking about uh, what immorality looks like from a Jewish mindset. Uh, and it's based, don't be sexual moral, don't be idolatrous, don't be impure like, like Gentiles. But then Paul also is going to engage with his wider culture and what, what uh, a Greek and Roman audience would have thought about immorality. And so he draws on uh, philosophical tradition, particularly uh, the uh, sophist, um, or the Stoic tradition uh, that would come up um, with passion and desire. And so you have here passion, and he doesn't just say desire, he calls it evil desire. And so uh, Paul wants his audience to think, look, you need to be watching out for your passions and your desires. Um, in Greek and Roman thought, the way that you avoided passion and desire was you had a life that, that was lived according to reason, that if you used your mind, uh, that your mind could control your passions and desires. Um, and Paul's going to say it's not going to be a proper mentality, a proper reason that allows you to control these things. Instead, it's going to have a mind that's set on Christ uh, that allows us to overcome our passions and our desires. Um, and so you, you get these, these kind of two groups that Paul, he's trying to do a catch-all that whether you're a Jewish person or whether you're a Greek and Roman person, they would have looked at this list and said, yeah, these are earthly things. These are immoral things. We don't want to do these things. These are things that we should avoid. And Paul says, the way to avoid these things is by having a heavenly mindset. Um, it's interesting here as well that you get greed getting connected, connected to idolatry. Um, we have kind of in modern uh, Christian traditions, we, we talk about how uh, we can worship our wealth and we can consider our possessions to be a form of idolatry. Um, and we see that kind of tradition even showing up here in Paul, that a love of, of an overlove of wealth, an overlove of money uh, can be seen something as worshiping something other than God. When we, it's, one, it's, it's not bad to have wealth and possessions, but it is bad when we make achieving and gaining wealth and possessions to be our, our primary goal. And when we use that as something that's more important to us than, um, than God. And so that's considered idolatry. So it says, look, put to death these things. It's a, it's, you need to die to this stuff. You cannot participate in these things anymore. And the way you do that is um, by having a heavenly mindset. He says, be careful on account of these things, God's wrath is coming for people who are disobedient. Uh, these are the way, and then he says, these are things that you used to do. These are things you once followed when you lived that old way of life. So think about your old way of life, the things that you used to do. You used to do these things. Um, stop doing them. Um, and be careful because the re one reason you stopped doing them is because you were accountable to God. The wrath of God was against you because you were sinners. But, but now, you're saved. And so Paul says, but now you must get rid of these things. Then he gets to another uh, vice list, which is a little bit different than the, than the vice list that he previously had. And so I've got here anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive language from your mouth. Um, these, are, um, these are more common uh, things. So uh, they're not the big baddies. So the first list, it would be like um, if you talk to someone today and you said, well, you need to be a follower of Jesus. And they say, well, no, I don't really need to do that. You know, I'm not a murderer. Um, I'm not, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not a criminal. I don't go around stealing things from everybody. I'm not a bad person. And whatever kind of those big categories of badness that people put out for morality, that's what this first list is doing. The fornication and purity. That's like, well, surely, you know, that's, that's, list. I'm, I'm not like, I'm not bad. I'm not like Hitler. I'm not, I'm, I'm not like Stalin. I'm not a really bad person like what we see here. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person with flaws, is what, what people might say. You know, God's going to love me, even though I've got, you know, a few flaws, a few character defects, but God's not going to judge me because I don't have any of these big, big ones. Well, now in, in verse 8, Paul starts to get more at the little things, more of the little sins, um, the, the anger, the wrath, um, you know, uh, the, the malice, uh, slander, ab abusive language. These are things... Uh, these are still heavy hitting terms, but these are more common uh, that people struggled with back then and people struggle with today. Um, and so it says, look, it's not just the big sins that you need to be getting rid of your life, the things that are, that are clearly bad, uh, but we also need to be getting rid of the little sins in life, the things that we say, well, it, you know, 
I was angry today, but you know, that's just who I am. I'm just, God will, God will forgive me. Um, you know, I, I, I misspoke about someone. I, um, I slandered them. You know, that's okay. I, you know, that happens sometimes, you know, people sometimes, uh, say bad things about me. It's okay. Um, oh, I had language that wasn't as kind as it should have been. I, I put someone down today, but you know, that's just how we are. We just kind of put people down. Um, Paul says, no, um, you know, even those things. And he says, don't lie to one another. Don't be dishonest. Um, and I don't think Paul's just saying um, that he, that the Corinthians have this particular problem of going around being deceitful saying, well, um, you know, uh, I'd love to have you all over at my house today, but honestly, I, I can't because I've, I've got to go, um, I've got to go down to the, the fields and, and, and do some work today. He's not, it's not those kind of excuses. He's saying, look, uh, they, they may be part of the excuses, but it's really, you know, don't be dis, don't be dishonest even with, uh, your, with everything. And that can include, uh, your levels of, of godliness. Are you being honest with each other about your flaws or is everyone coming together, um, saying, you know, we're perfect. There's nothing wrong with me or that these things aren't problems in our life. So, so Paul's really trying to cover everything, both the big sins and the small sins. And then he also makes it social. He says, look, you're accountable to each other for your sins. So don't be dishonest with each other. Don't lie to each other about the difficulties and the problems in your life that you're facing. So related to this, I, you know, we can ask ourselves, um, it may be easy. How do we avoid stereotypical sins? That's probably an easy one. You can start there as a jumping point, but then how do we go about avoiding our personal sins? Um, and, and even probably more importantly, how do we go about being honest with each other about the struggles we face, about, about the sins that we're dealing with in our lives um, as we try to uh, give up the things that are earthly mindset things versus the heavenly mindset things? So you know, what sort of things can we do? It's, Paul says put to death these things uh, and to get rid of these things, which is great. It's a nice idea, to get rid of these sins, but how do we do that? How do we start to deal with the sin in our lives? How do we go about doing this? Verse nine continues, seeing that you have stripped off your old self with its practices and you've clothed yourself with your new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of its creator. Um, in that renewal, there is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. But Christ is all and in all. So here Paul's getting in, into uh, clothing language. He says, you know, take off the clothes of your old self and clothe yourself in a new self, um, which is Christ. Uh, so Paul's encouraging the Colossians to put on this garment of Christ. And this is going back, drawing on the baptismal language and the resurrection language. When we, when we die, this is like stripping off our old self. We're taking off our old clothes of our own bodies and we're putting on new clothes. Um, you know, I, I know right now, uh, part of our practices, whenever we have to go to the grocery store or doctor's office, um, I usually do this in the morning and, and I do this before I'm going to take a shower in the morning. And so I I, I go to the store in whatever, some dirty clothes I have, and I go and I do my thing. And then when I come back, I strip off the old clothes, I throw them in the laundry, uh, I take my shower, and then I put on, on new clothes. And it's amazing how, um, how much better I feel after I've taken my shower and put on my new clothes. I feel, I feel more safe. I feel more in control. I don't feel... Uh, I don't feel the anxiety of the, of the potential dirtiness of having germs and diseases on my body. I think right now we're very intentional about uh, what is unclean and what is clean. Um, and even it's interesting because we often, we often critique uh, Jewish purity practices. We often critique the purity codes that we find in the Old Testament. Uh, and those were more ritual based, but I think we're also getting the sense of the importance between cleanliness and purity, that, that we're starting to see greater value to that, that, uh, that there really is something different between being unclean 
and being clean. For a Jewish person, it's not a physical cleanliness, it's, it's a spiritual cleanliness, it's a sinful cleanliness, dirtiness versus cleanliness. And I think that's Paul was getting at here is just as, um, just as I'm intentional about stripping off my old dirty clothes when I go to the grocery store, when I come back from the grocery store, um, just as I'm intentional about that and play on new clothes, the question is big, why am I not intentional about stripping off my old sinful habits of my old body. Why, why don't I get appalled by, by the dirtiness that's brought about by the infection that's caused when I fall back into my life of sin? Uh, instead, I, you know, I put on those old grubby clothes again. I think, oh, this is great. I'm just in, in my old comfortable ways. It's like um, I've got that, uh, that pair of clothes that I've, that I've worn forever, that it's just, it just feels so comfortable and natural. And, and yet, uh, Paul's challenging us uh, to get rid of those things uh, and to be excited about putting on our new clothes, the, the new clothes of Christ. Um, and maybe here you might think about, you know, the excitement that comes uh, for when you've gotten, you know, maybe that new pair of shoes or, or that, that new dress or that new outfit that, that sometimes uh, we can get really excited about the new things that we have. And that's what Paul wants to do. He wants us to get excited about putting on this new life of Christ, uh, that we want to find value in that new life of Christ. And so, you know, just as you think about it, think about the things that where you feel good about taking off that old, that old outfit and putting on a new outfit. Maybe you think about a situation like my, my grocery store situation, or maybe you think about um, that new outfit that you got. You know, my kids right now, as they keep growing, um, we have to put away the the small clothes and we and we get out the, the newer sets of clothes and it's fun with like both Pax and with Eden because they end up wearing clothes that both Gus and Zoe have worn before and so we're kind of in the spring cleaning phase right now where Lisa's been getting out the the new clothes for for Eden and the new clothes for Pax and the new clothes for Zoe and the new clothes for Gus and there's a lot of joy that happens with that because they get excited about some of the new things that they get to wear and um and they go around just wearing all sorts of crazy weird outfits right now uh, because they're so excited about that. But there's also uh, can be some sadness. It's like you kind of have to sneak away a few of those outfits that the kids maybe just don't quite fit into anymore because because they're growing, they've changed, they're different. Um, but it's but at some point they're going to outgrow those clothes. They can't keep wearing uh, those that pair of pants that just keep getting higher and higher up their legs, or they get tighter and tighter. They need new clothes. And that's what Paul's talking about with us, is that we have outgrown the old clothes of our life. They're old. They're, they're, they're no longer valuable. We need to be excited about putting on the new clothes of Christ. Um, and, and that this is new clothes that are renewed. In all. And then he says, in the image of the creator. And here, this is echoing Genesis 127, where in the creation story, we see that God, at the end of creation, he says, God made humankind in his image, he made them male and female in his image. Uh, and part of the story of the Bible is that when God made people, we were perfect, we were good, but with sin, it, it corrupted, it broke that image. And part of the story of Christ's redemption is, is it's meant to be a restoration of that image, that uh, rather than being a broken image, a flawed image, this image that we were created in, in Adam and Eve, that now with Jesus, he comes and fixes that image, and we have this new image, um, the image of Christ that Jesus comes and restores and fixes. And so Paul wants us to think about that Jesus came to, res to restore the things of creation, to fix the things that have been broken. And that when we put on our new self, we're putting on this, this, this clothing of Christ, and we have, we have his image. When God sees us, God sees Christ. He no longer sees us, and it's a restored perfect image, just like God made a perfect image of Adam and Eve. And when God sees us um, in that renewal, that image of Christ, we're now, we're now bound together. He says, there's no longer Jew and Greek, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but in Christ is all in and all. Um, here, Paul uh, is reminding the Colossians that um, by being united in Christ, the reconciliation that God brings, it's not just a personal salvation. It's, it's a reconciliation between groups that had divided themselves between us and them. Uh, so you get uh, the Greeks, uh, they would have seen themselves as the educated ones versus the barbarians. Uh, the Jews saw themselves as Jews versus the Gentiles. 
Uh, and Paul says, no, you're now together. You're both Jews and Greeks. And then circumcised and uncircumcised. This is a way of classifying, well, am I, am I chosen by God as, as the sign of circumcision or am I not chosen by God, the uncircumcised? Uh, am I a barbarian? Am I, am I the, uh, for Greeks, this is the uneducated. The, the barbarian comes from the word bar, 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 bar. It's based on the sound. If that's what, uh, they sound like gibberish to a Greek person. And so they say, are you barbarians? Are you Scythians? Uh, are you part of the free group or are you slaves? Now in the ancient world, at probably um, uh, one third of the Roman empire could have been slaves. One third might've been former slaves. Um, and there was a prize in what it meant to be free. And even once you were freed from being slaves, you were still considered a former slave. There's this ideal of freedom that shows up in the ancient world. Um, of course, and Paul, Paul says, look, this dichotomy between people who are always free and people that have been slaves, this no longer exists. Instead, Christ is in all, uh, that the racial boundaries are broken down, that the I'm chosen and you're not, the religious boundaries are broken down, that the social boundaries are broken down, that the economic boundaries are broken down, uh, that we are all renewed in Christ. This is what it looks like when we put on our new robe. When we, when we start to divide people based on um, race or ethnicity, when we divide people versus the haves and the have-nots, when we divide people according to um, class and status, um, that we're falling back into the old way of things. And Paul wants to remind the Colossians that that in Christ, we are all together in Christ, that we have all been made equal. This reminiscent in Galatians, Paul talks about we're neither slave nor free, male nor female, that we're all one in Christ. This is something, this is one of the themes that Paul continually has, that in Christ, we are all in this together. We are all equals in Christ because of what he has done. Um, so as you think about this, uh, this question, you know, we can ask ourselves, uh, how do we stereotype people? Those are, Paul's giving kind of the stereotypes of his day, but we can ask, well, what do we do to stereotype people? What are we overdoing to overcome our own natural prejudices um, as we think about that? Or another way, or you, maybe as we've read this passage, you want to think about um, this attraction to old clothing. What are the old things that we keep putting on because they feel so comfortable? Uh, so what do we do to get excited about the new clothes of Christ so that we're willing to put away uh, our old clothes? Um, so you can kind of hit on either of those ideas if you want. Either what do we do to get excited about putting on the new clothes of Christ versus our old clothes, or uh, how can we be challenged as a church to, or as individuals to, to um, see people as united in Christ versus uh, the ways that we like to stereotype and 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 make an us versus them categories of, in order to make us ourselves feel better about ourselves. Carl. Good, Chris. Well, I think um, many times it's because we just don't know the person or we don't know the group of people well, or we've never walked in their shoes. It is easy to maybe talk about people as they rather than a person. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And I think, you know, right now, even why I want to bring the stereotype stuff as well is because we're seeing um, these old habits even rearing themselves up right now, right? As we're, we started off with social lockdown, everything was, we're, we're in this together as a country and we can see it in the news and our Facebook feeds, how more and more uh, points of disagreement, uh, the media is casting people according to stereotypes. I mean, we're looking at the, um, the protest, uh, you know, in Michigan, for example, uh, the media is highlighting, you've got all these people coming with guns to, the, to block hospitals. You know, that's meant to elicit certain reactions uh, to people. Um, you've got in Sacramento, people wearing magna hats are getting put into the pictures or the beach closures um, in Orange County, all these pictures of people super close together. Um, these kind of images, they're there uh, to divide us. Um, to make us think, well, other people are, are being, um, they're, they're those kind of people. They're the kind of people that we want to disagree with, rather than helping to create empathy 
uh, with us. Um, it's amazing. We may not agree with people or we may agree with people either way, but you, but the first step is empathy. So you got to get to know people. Uh, before we disagree with people, we have to empathize with them first and they have to empathize with us uh, instead of stereotyping. All, stereotypes always leads to division, always leads to trouble um, as well. So, thanks, Chris. I think that um, another group of people that we often stereotype and we don't really mean to, but we do it, is disabled people. Yeah. And, um, we have a little nephew, I think you might remember years ago, um, <clears throat> who had a, well, about seven or eight years ago, had a little boy that had to have both of his legs amputated. And he has prosthetics and he's just doing great. But it's still hard when you see him walking around on his stumps, even though we've known him for a long time, you imagine how it's hard for even Rick and I sometimes, but if, if he were to be visited by people that didn't even know him, it's just hard. You know, it's like you don't know what to say because it's so, it's such a um, unusual situation that he's in. And, uh, but to him, he'll say to our little grandson, Ben, aren't you gonna relax and take your legs off? And Ben's like, what? <laughs> You know, but they're the same age, and to Jake, relaxing is taking his prosthetics off so he can relax. And then he has a little stumps that he walks around on, which is heartbreaking in many ways, but that's his normal. And when you get into a person's normal, you see things a lot differently, and it, it breaks down the barriers. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I think, you know, even... Um, for me, as you hear that story, I think partly with, with uh, people with disabilities, partly like we get very uncomfortable. It shows our own insecurities uh, in those moments. Um, and it becomes about us <laughs> in, the, yeah. in those moments, right? So uh, um, instead of, of true compassion uh, for, for other people. And um, so that's, that's good. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Chris. That's a great reminder. Anyone else? Yeah, one, one quick one. Um, it used to be when I was driving more that the people that frustrated me were the people at the, off the off ramps of the freeway who would be out, you know, begging for money or whatever. And lately I've spent a lot of time with our dog going back and forth to the park and walking around. And there's people now that I run into who are homeless. Uh, they hang out at the park during the day and I, they, they, I don't, I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to either go up to them and talk to them or just say, so usually I acknowledge them, say hi and something like that. But I, I, I need help trying to figure out how do I approach somebody that's homeless? How do I, and how do you do that? And so that's one of the issues I'm dealing with right now. <laughs> Carl? Yeah, that's, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, in America, we really have a unique situation because we have so many different kinds of people. And so we have the opportunities to give people a chance. And so we need to always remind ourselves in one day, in a normal situation, we can run across all different kinds of people um, just sitting in a doctor's office, going to the grocery store. And so in, in ways we can communicate, sometimes just saying hello, just smiling. And I think we have to constantly work on that because we can, if we only know a certain small population of some people, sometimes we can be skewed and we have to be careful. So we have to be open and give each individual a real chance um, in our lives and not just put them in a box. But in America, we can do that. When we've traveled um, around the world, you know, when you go to Germany, you mostly see German people. You see some others, but you kind of see the same people all the time in some of these countries. But in our country, it's very unique. And so we have the opportunity to really work at giving people a chance and um, letting each person, um, you know, let them show them, show us who they are. Yeah, we are in a fortunate place. And particularly in Southern California, we're very... Um, 
blessed with having a lot of people that we can expose ourselves to. Um, and um, I think it's wonderful. Gene, I think with, with people, homeless people that you're encountering, simply by acknowledging them as people, that's, that's an important first step. Um, we're, we're obviously in a bit of a unique situation right now where we still have to practice social distancing um, with this stuff. But um, I think giving people, acknowledging that people are there and a voice is important. And pick up the homeless population, at least in my news cycles, I'm not really seeing people talking about that as much um, in the midst of all the quarantine and stuff. Maybe some people have had um, more at attentiveness, but I, I feel like that's been one of those populations that there was that was really high in the news um, in our news cycle before Corona hit, and now it's it's one of those it's it, it's almost non-existent at least in my news cycle, and so I think treating people as people um, uh, is hugely important, and being aware of that even if it, we're not letting ourselves get dictated simply by um, what. Uh, others are wanting us to have attentiveness to, I think is important. So it's good. We're gonna keep moving forward. Um, just, and I, I'm proud of this this class for that in general. Um, and I, I think that, you know, those kind of opportunities, talking about, uh, Chris, I love with your story, your nephew, I think one of the things that we tend to do with diversity is we wanna talk about how everyone's the same. And yeah, we're all human beings. We're all creating the image of God. We're all, in Paul's image, we're all clothed in Christ. And that's important. But we're also all different, and um, and it can be. And I think things like racism are interesting. It shows up in when we make everyone so different from us. That's that's a form of racism. But if we make everyone exactly like us, that's another form of racism. <laughs> and it's it's threading the needle between celebrating our commonality as well as our differences is what's important. Um, and we do that by listening and talking to people. So. Uh, it reminds me, it, we're at Gus right now. We're sw we've been swimming, and he's trying to get a little bit of a tan on himself. Um, he did. He's not as pasty white as I am, uh, but it it was uh, funny because he was saying, "Well, I want to become tan like my friend Sawyer," and Sawyer's Mexican. Uh, and then and then he was talking about how Sawyer wants to become um, uh, he wants to become tan uh, like. Um, uh, like another one of Gus's friends, Isaac uh, Chevalier, uh, who uh, who's <laughs> African American descent. So it's like these three different colors of skin, uh, and just amongst boys, like just talking about that and just living in it. But like for them, it's all sun and summer. But being able to use that opportunity to talk about well, you know, similarities and differences here, and we're all from different backgrounds, but we're all Americans here together. And isn't it amazing uh, that we live in Southern California, where this can all we can all come together uh, and we can be friends like that. And, and just to have those kind of opportunities to talk about that, I think are really important to have uh, for kids and, and to see something in value that you, that you want uh, to be like other people is good and stuff as well. So anyways. Um, can I say one thing real quick? Yeah, go ahead. I heard something that was very insightful to me. Somebody shared something on Facebook and it said, we keep saying that we're all in the same boat. And they said, the truth is we might all be in the same storm, but we are not always in the same boat. And remembering that our boat may look, might look different than somebody else's, even though we're weathering a storm, is a really good insight to have with other people. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great insight, Cheryl. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great analogy. We want, we, we talk about it, yeah, we're all in the same boat. Um, but we're really not. Again, you can kind of visualize when you look at celebrities and they're like, oh, it's so hard being quarantined at home. And then they're like poolside or they're at their giant castles. Um, it's, it's not the same, but I don't, I look at it, I get convicted because, because I've got a pool. I'm in sunny Southern California. Like it reminds me, I'm really not in quarantine the same way as people in downtown Los Angeles are in quarantine. Uh, I'm not, it, I'm not experiencing this the same way that our homeless population, like Jean has brought out. Uh, and so Cheryl, thank you for that. Yeah, we really aren't all in the same boat, <laughs> but we are experiencing the same storm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't also try to get more people into our boats <laughs> and or help people's boats improve if we can uh, is important. So that's great. Thank you for sharing that. 
All right. Uh, so then Paul continues on as you clothe yourself in Christ. As God's chosen ones, be holy and beloved. Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Put up with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another person, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive each other. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Um, I love this section. As he starts to talk about being clothed, he says, uh, you're chosen by God. Um, you're holy, so you're set apart to God. You're chosen by God. You've been. Uh, this is language that is drawn from the Old Testament. Israel was God's chosen people. Israel was uh, God's holy people. Israel is God's beloved. So these are all terms that were used to describe the people of God in the Old Testament, Israel. But now Paul's saying, look, because we're in Christ, everyone is chosen. Everyone is holy. Everyone is beloved. If you're in Christ, it doesn't matter where you came from. What matters is who you're connected with. Uh, and you're beloved. And in Colossians, it's interesting, there's several groups that get described as beloved. Christ is first described as beloved, and at the end of the letter, um, we're going to have two people in the Colossian community, Tychius and Onesimus, get described as beloved. And then Luke, who's with Paul, is also called beloved. So you get this general sense of, yeah, as a community, we're beloved, but Paul also wants to highlight, to point out uh, specific individuals who are beloved by God. Uh, as well, that we are, that we are, because we are beloved, uh, because of this, this is why we're going to clothe ourselves this way. Our uh, being loved by God allows us um, to do these things. Um, having a relationship with Christ allows us to do these things. Uh, and so he says uh, some of the things, again, this is just an example list. Uh, like he had the vice list of examples. These are examples of virtues, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Um, I've also highlighted uh, love and, and forgiveness and peace and thankfulness, that these are the sort of characters, the sort of qualities that we need to have if we're going to clothe ourselves in Christ. Um, it's amazing how, how much easier it is uh, for me uh, to be able to uh, go out and relate in the world and relate with each, with each other uh, when I have a sense of, of security of my love uh, for um, my love with my family, whether it's Lisa, whether it's my kids, when I have a sense of security that I'm loved by them, it's so much easier for me uh, to go out and to love them back and, and, and to go out and to love people that are less lovable in the world. Because if I have a hard day at my job, that's okay, because I know I'm going to come home and I'm going to see my wife and kids, and I know that they love me. And so I can go out in the world and I can do things that maybe are hard on hard days because I find the love of my family strengthens me. And what Paul wants to say is not only can we experience that kind of love and strength in our human relationships, but how much more should we be able to go out in the world and do things for God because of the love that God has for us? Uh, because God first loved us, we can love one another is what John, the uh, letter of 1 John is going to talk about. Uh, and Paul's using that same idea that because we're loved by God, we can go out and, and exhibit uh, these characters, these virtues like uh, compassion, meekness, that we can forgive each other because we are anchored in the love of God. Um, and so Paul brings up forgive one another just as God has forgiven you. This might recall the Lord's Prayer where, where we, in Jesus' Lord Prayer, Jesus says, forgive us of our sins as those who have sinned against us or forgive us our debts as uh, those, uh, the debts against us. Um, or you can think about um, Peter asking Jesus, how many times should I forgive somebody else? Seven times? And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And then he gives the parable of, of the unforgiving servant who had a you know, billion dollars worth of debt against him. And he goes out and he tries to shake people down for a few thousand dollars worth of stuff and, and the ridiculousness of that. And so just again, remind us that God has forgiven us a, a great debt. And because of that, it should be easy for us to forgive other people. Uh, because we are loved by God, it should be easy for us to love other people. Because we experience peace with Christ in our hearts, we should be able to have a peace in our hearts. And in all this should result in attitudes of gratitude. That it comes back to 
having a solid relationship with Christ that allows us to have better relationships with other people. Um, and if we neglect our relationship with Christ, it can be so easy for these other things to start to fall apart. Um, and because of the busyness of life so often, we forget about having that attentiveness to cultivating that relationship. Um, it's like a plant. If you aren't daily cultivating that plant of giving it food and water and sunlight, it's going to become unhealthy. It's not going to bear fruit. But if you tend to that plant and take care of it, it naturally bears fruit uh, because of the cultivation that's happening, because you're giving it the food, the water, and the nutrients. You can't just make a plant produce vegetables. It doesn't happen that way. It has to be taken care of. In the Christian life, we have to cultivate our relationship with Christ if we want to bear fr fruit of virtue, of, of treating people well. It all goes back to our relationship with Christ. So we can ask ourselves, uh, oh, in this passage, he says, I love this, put up with one another, and, in verse 13, put up with one another. If anyone has a complaint against you, eat you forgive one another. And I, it's like, I love that thing of put up, but don't just put up with people, forgive people. So I just kind of wonder, you know, <laughs> do we put up with people or are we people that are actually forgiving people? I think it's easy for us to put up with people, but it can be harder for us to actually forgive them. Yeah. I'm going to move to our uh, last section, and, then, and we'll have one last set of questions here. Uh, verse 16, let the word, the logos of Christ, Christ, dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom with gratitude, that's the word grace, in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word, in logos, or deed, aragon, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So Paul is continuing this theme of, of give thanks, of, of have an attitude of gratitude. Um, and the key to having an attitude of gratitude is that you let Christ's word dwell in us, that we are clothed in Christ, that we're clothed in love, that we're clothed in forgiveness, uh, that we're clothed in the virtues. When we allow Christ to dwell in us, to, to be rich us, then we discover um, as a community that we can teach and admonish each other uh, and we can cultivate an attitude of grace, an attitude of gratitude in, in our lives and that it becomes contagious as a community. If we're part of a community that is grateful, it's more natural for us uh, to be grateful. And th this gratefulness bubbles over uh, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So he's, he's talking about ways that we can be thankful to God uh, with this stuff. And, but he, and then he talks about, well, it's not just your words. It's not just, well, say the right things, but also do the right things in Jesus. And when we do that, this allows us to give thanks to God. Uh, and I put a few verses here showing that um, this idea of giving thanks, it's a theme in Colossians. In Colossians uh, one twelve, Paul gives thanks for the community, but then he's going to talk about how they need to be giving thanks to God in 2.7 and 3.15 and 4.2. And here in 417, that uh, understanding our relationship with Christ helps us to have a grateful, positive attitude, um, and it allows things to bubble over. Um, and so uh, uh, this kind of final section, um, Paul is keen in on, if we let Christ dwell with us, if we let him build his house with us, uh, th then we will naturally boil over and to do these, these good things, these good deeds, these, these good words. Uh, naturally, we can't help ourselves uh, with this stuff. So I want us to think in closing, you know, what do we do to cultivate our relationship with Christ? How do we invite him into our lives so that we feel that security, that confidence that we are loved by Christ uh, that Christ has forgiven us? How do we set that foundation so that we feel right in our relationship with him? But then how do we go beyond it? How do we cultivate this attitude of gratitude in our lives? How do we cultivate an attitude of thanksgiving that Paul's talking about? Not just in words. It's one thing to say, I'm so thankful about things, but uh, to have a holistic attitude of gratitude is covers both our words and our actions. So what do we do in our lives to cultivate this attitude of gratitude. And I think this is particularly important for us right now because uh, we have to be particularly attentive 
to our thoughts and our actions right now to cultivate that attitude of gratitude because it's easy for us to start to spin into attitudes of discontent and dissatisfaction because we are all in this moment where we're kind of put on hold in our lives.